he called me and he said, hey, I'm doing this movie called The Devil's Rejects with Rob Zombie. And I told him about you. Um, oh, wow. I think he's going to call for you. And I was like, cool. So Rob calls me and he's like, hey, we're making the ultimate white trash horror movie. And we think your music would be perfect. <laughs> Which is kind of like a one-handed compliment. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Welcome to the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Join me and a famous guest. We discuss their career, life, food, Texas, and everything in between. Let's get started. Hi, guys, and welcome to another episode of the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Let's get started. My guest today is Jesse Dayton. Who is he? What is he? Why is he? We we don't answer any of that. I don't know why I said that. But look, (laughs) Jesse Dayton is an awesome dude. Okay. He's a musician, filmmaker as well. This guy's done it all. He has played with some of the best people, worked with some of the best people, just, you know, and he's one of these best people. Um, He tells some great stories. Okay. Phenomenal stories about some country legends, you know, Willie, for instance. That's all. You know what? I'm not going to spoil it. Just some really cool stories. And he's just done some amazing things. Worked with Rob Rob Zombie on some films. He was in Halloween. Um, He directed his own uh, horror film as well. In the horror community, he's very well known. Um, And in music as well. You know, guy's got it made. He's living in Austin. Drops a nice little exclusive in the interview about a project he's got coming up. I don't want to spoil that, so pay you know be ready for that. Um, and uh, you know he was just a great guy to talk to. That is the truth. You know, just a really cool guy to talk to. Um, and I hope we get to hang out. We said something about it. You know, say that a lot with different guests, and you know. A lot of times it's just being manners. It's just being nice because we're Texans. Uh, but, you know, looking forward to it. Anyway, uh, so Jesse Day, this is a great interview. Really, really cool. Um, so, but before we get to that, I have a sneak peek at an interview uh, that we're going to be releasing on YouTube only. Okay. You, our YouTube exclusive series, I guess you should say, uh, that we're doing. Um, this is with uh, Nathan Heath. Uh, from a company called Cultivate. I'll make sure I get that right. And um, they've got this new app they're developing uh, that he wanted to come on and talk about. It is awesome. Okay. So basically, we delve, you know, dive deeper into it. Uh, but basically, they're just trying to bring the garden to you, right? That is the simplest way I'll say it, you know, where you can have your own vegetables and this and that to you. Anyway, I'll let him explain all that. So here's just a little sneak peek of that interview. And again, you'll find the full one on YouTube, our YouTube channel, the Lone Star Play podcast. All right, here's a sneak peek of that uh, interview. You put in you put in your zip code, it brings up the best thing to plant in your garden. Yeah. Right? That's so like, it. that's you basically know, it. You know, I have you can have that, the standard garden plan, a four by eight days box, or you can choose a different size. It'll generate that. And then if you, if you like that plan, you accept it. If you don't, you generate another one. And you can put your new okay. preference. In there. If you hate beets, they won't tell you to grow beets. If you love beets, Oh, I great. see. Okay, cool. Okay, I yeah. see. I see. Yeah. Okay, yeah. No, that's great. That is Yeah, great. we don't want to wow. suggest you to grow stuff you hate. <laughs> sure. Well, maybe you learned to like. You never had it the right way. I mean, maybe that's the second tier, right? Like, you'll yeah. come back around to that uh, uh, later on. No, that's yeah, really great. Um, that's really great. And then, after that, if you want, uh, we'll be providing the actual seeds for those varieties if you want to get them from us and the whole seed starting kit and everything. Oh, that's awesome. So no matter where you live, you'll get this shipped to, you know, in the mail to you to get you going. Yep. That's awesome. And if you want to, yeah. if, if, if you just want the garden plan, it's 100% free. Sure. So the yeah. whole app is free and you'll get the garden plan 100%. There's no, no catches on that. It's just if that's you want great. the seeds, we'll definitely mail them to you. That's awesome. All right. So that's Nathan Heath with Cultivate. And again, you can find that interview on our YouTube channel, the Lone Star Plate podcast. I think it has podcast in it. If not, just Lone Star Plate 
podcast. Anyway, <laughs> Nathan Heath. Okay. All right. Let's get to our uh, main interview with Jesse Dayton. Again, this is an awesome interview. Super excited about it. Uh, but before we get to that, we're going to do a quick uh, segment of, uh, from our sponsor, Texas Real Food. That's right. Texas Real Food. Amazing stuff. Okay. So here's that uh, uh, quick word from our sponsor, Texas Real Food, and then we'll be right back. Hi, I wanted to talk to you about what's on the Texas Real Food site that's more than just putting in your zip code and finding, you know, the coolest butcher, farmer's market, restaurant around you. There's also other resources on the site, recipes, articles, and one in particular is called the Texas Mom Blog. It's awesome. Faria Khan is writing these beautiful articles. You can really learn a lot about Texas just giving you a lot of other things to think about. Food, family, everything behind that goes into food as well. So just different topics and uh, conversations. Definitely something worth checking out as well. All right, back to the show. Okay, please check out Texas Real Food. They're amazing. You know, what else you want me to say? TexasRealFood.com. All right. What's next? Yes, I got to tell you, social media. That's right. Check us out, Lone Star Plate TX, or just search the Lone Star Plate podcast. Uh, and of course, our YouTube channel. Please subscribe where you find uh, you know exclusive interviews like the Nathan Heath one. This is sort of a new thing we're starting. Not every episode, but every once in a while, we're going to drop a little sneak peek and then give the full interview on YouTube. So there'll be sort of exclusives. And again, we break down the... the uh, interview into clips and stuff too. So it, that's pretty cool too. And you can see it if you're just listening to it. So you see this beautiful face, this beautiful mug. Okay. This just doesn't happen overnight, y'all. Okay. There's a lot of work that goes into this. There's a lot of lights, a lot of help. Okay. Genetics. Okay. This beauty right here, this beautiful, you know, I feel like Achilles. Okay. That's enough. Um, let's get to this interview with Jesse Dayton. Again, super cool guy. Y'all are going to absolutely love this. The stories are amazing. Can't wait to break these into clips uh, as well. So again, Jesse Dayton, boom, let's get to it. Enjoy. Hey, man. Hey, how we doing? How you doing? I'm awesome, man. I love life. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad you are. Um, it's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, brother. How are you doing today? How's your day going? I'm well. I'm, you know, just trudging the happy road to destiny, you know, <laughs> slouching into Bethlehem, as they say. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's great, man. Well, listen, thanks so much for for joining us, man. I really appreciate it. This is going to be awesome. I'm, I'm really excited to uh, to chat with you today. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I uh, Well, I was just going to say, man, I was just listening to your cover of... Oh, no. Now I'm going to screw this up, Patrick. Uh, the, I knew you were going to do this. Uh, your cover of you, Just What I Needed. Okay, I needed to yeah, sing it. Yeah, I, just, I, needed, I, I needed to sing it first. Uh, dude, yeah. so good. What a great cover of that tune. Thanks, man. Yeah, I did. Um, I, I started doing that song as a bet when I was on, I was on tour with this band, Social Distortion. And it was at a time when... Um, you know, Nashville had become so incredibly just youth oriented and commercial. There was no way guys like me were going to be able to, you know, <laughs> penetrate that demographic. And yeah. And so I started going on tour with like really big punk rock bands and they would sell out every, yeah, they would sell out every night. And, I, awesome. and, and, and so I played that song one night, like, you know, I had my guitar and I was just kidding around <laughs> and and I started doing it between songs. And I was saying, I'll say, what if George Jones sang the cards? <laughs> and it was like, I don't mind you coming here and wasting all my time, time. And uh, oh, that's so good. That's and everybody good. would crack up, you know. And yeah. It was like a little joke between songs. And then, you know, um, it progressed. Guy, they were like, "Hey, you should do that for real." Yeah, so, yeah. 
Oh, it's solid. It's solid, dude. It's really solid. In fact, when I, I first heard it, it's one of those moments you have where you hear a song. I don't know if this happens to you. I'm sure it does. You hear a song. You're like, wait, 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 what's that from? I, I, I honestly couldn't pinpoint it at first. What? Who sings that song? I was like, oh, what is that song? You know, it took me asking yeah. Alexa. Thank God for, for Alexa. Yeah, the chorus hits. Of course. Well, even the chorus hit. And I was like, I still couldn't figure it out. Dude, that's yeah. how bad I am. I'm so bad with lyrics. I couldn't think. Of, I knew the song. But I couldn't think of. Uh, who su who sung the song? I was like, who right, sings sure, that song? Sure. I couldn't remember. You know, I'm horrible with well, that, man. You know, I, um, I don't know if we're going right now. Are we going? Right yeah, now? yeah. I, that's how I roll, dude. I oh, just cool, fucking, cool, cool. I, you know, we're just gonna have yeah, a cool start. back. Of, you know yeah, what I mean? I absolutely. keep it easy. Um, well, I um, I ended up doing a whole covers record of songs that I thought would make great country songs, and I actually did an Elton John song called Country Comfort. Oof. And uh, and he played it. Elton John played my version on his uh, radio show and then gave me a big shout out. Oh, and, shit. And, and after he did my uh, my numbers on my social network kind of uh, went, <laughs> went went large. And it was, I bet. Of course. It was great. Yeah. And he he mess. I messaged him on I uh, DM him on Twitter and said, hey. Thanks wow. so much. I love you. And he wrote me back two hearts. Oh, dude. And, I, and I, for the whole day, I was like, hey, man, Elton John just like, <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I'm good Done. now. Yeah, yeah, I'm good now. Yeah, exactly. Like, you need to do something. I, dude, I am good. Okay, we're, yeah, we're good. Yeah. That's a, that's at least, you know, for me, that would be a lifetime of, of yeah, good I think, for me. Uh, no, that's amazing, man. Wow. What you would. Uh, is that what you hope for if when you do a cover? Are you hoping to get recognition from the person that you covered it? Or do you not like are you looking for approval from that cover? Does that make sense? I don't think you're looking, or no. I don't think you're look you can do it looking for approval, but I do think it's important. Like when I do a cover, I think about what would the writer, maybe not the artist, but the guy who actually sat down and wrote the song, what would he think was cool? Okay, okay, that makes so, sense. So yeah. if you start there as an artist, you're set, man. Yeah. But if you just go in and you just completely mimic the original version and, you know, you don't change the, you know, arrangement, you don't change the key, it sounds like the exact same thing as the other one, except you're not the guy or yeah. the girl, <laughs> uh, then what's the point, man? You know I agree. I mean? I agree. Uh, that's the whole point of a cover. Like, I want to hear a different version of it, right? Like a yeah. different. Yeah. You know, it's like those those covers that. Um, what is it? The vitamin string quartet? Is that who they're called? Yeah. I think that's what they're yeah. called. Yeah. I love all that stuff they do or any sort of, you know, orchestral instrumental version of us. Right. I love that stuff. It's right. Uh, it's well, so I think cool. I think, you know, um, and we don't have to talk about covers for an hour. But <laughs> no, I'll for sure. <laughs> but I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> But I'll tell you, I think that um, the old school country way of when everybody used to cut like a big song. Yeah. I think that was cool. And, and back in the day, you know, Willie, Merle Haggard, Johnny Cash, all those guys would cut it their own way. Yeah. George Jones, whoever. And it really sounded completely different. Sure. And now and now you don't do that as much, you know. Now it's uh, it's just That's a good it. point. Yeah, that's not something people do at all in fact, I don't no, think really. No, yeah. Don't really. Yeah. You're right. Uh that's and that's really cool. And that's really more when songwriters mattered more back then, do you think? Absolutely. Right? Yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, you know, it's a weird thing now because not that songs don't still matter, but Sure. Now, you know, with the you know, advent of technology and the youth market and everything's kind of disposable. And I said, I don't want to come off like, Hey, you kids get off my lawn. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you know, there is less focus, I think on a great chorus or sure. a, a bridge that's, that works or, you know, stuff like yeah. that. So, yeah. Attention to the, the, the song itself. I mean, you know, I don't know right. about you. Like, it's tough for me to get into newer stuff sometimes, yes. right? Just because it's like, yeah, you go back to the classics for a reason. I don't, you know, there's something about the structure, the the energy, the 
the song itself, there was a story. It mattered like there was a moment. I don't know. It was something different. Um, again, yeah. I guess that's the double edged sword of technology and progression. Right. It is. I mean, yeah, absolutely. And it's not that there's not great stuff coming out. Sure. Anymore. It's just never going to quite be. I, it's never going to quite be like it used to be. And yeah. I tell I tell people, they say, you know, um, I don't just listen to dead country guys, uh, uh, dead country artists. I listen to all kinds of dead artists. <laughs> that's Blue, funny. Rock, all kinds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's funny, man. That's, you know, and it's, it's interesting too. Now what's considered classic rock when you turn on the radio <laughs> and I put on classic rock, I'm like, wait, that's classic rock now. Like, no, that's like stone temple pilots. Like yes. what? <laughs> like, right. Like, You're like what? Yeah. It's and, 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 uh, yeah. And you know, it's, it, it is weird, you know, but you hear it, you, but at the same time, it's something that when it came out, I didn't hear it. It sounded new. It was fresh and, and it still is. But when I hear it now, it's like, I see, I hear the resemblance to some of the classic songs from, let's say, the late 60s or 70s. Uh, yeah. I, I, right? Like, I hear the connection. I mentioned Stone Temple Pilots because I was listening to uh, Jim Croce. I got a name recently, yeah. right? I had that song on repeat yeah, for a while. Oh, such a great song. Well, there's a part in it that is very STP-ish. Dun, 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 oh yeah, yeah right that part's kind of there's a part like that in the jim croce uh i got a name part i thought okay i see these connections of influence right right the influence so i guess you know just taking this further do you think that influence it comes out in music today from people back 20 years ago or is it just influenced no, by what for sure you think it does I I think it does subconsciously. And then there are people who just, you know, I heard uh, Elvis Costello say one time that all great songwriters are thieving magpies. <laughs> Meaning, you know, like Keith Richards and, and Jimmy Page said, between Led Zeppelin and Rolling Stones, we've had the best of Sun Records, Chess Records, and Motown Records because they just – they copped all those grooves and all those riffs and turned them into like kind of new things. Yeah. Uh, which that's the trick is, can you turn it into something new? Or are you just some kind of retro throwback? That's, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Totally. Is that what you try to do when you're writing? Music? I try to change it up, man. Always. I, I, I try to, always. I, yeah. I like, I like hybrids. I think the only new thing you can create are hybrids. What do you mean you by know? hybrid? What is that like genre wise? I mean, or? Like, I mean, like I grew up in Beaumont, Texas, listening to ZZ Top and George Jones. Gotcha. Or, or George Strait and The Clash or whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. And so now I put those things together, which at the time seemed really weird because they were two different groups and they hated sure. each other and, you know, rock didn't like the rednecks and red dicks didn't like the hippies and, you know, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Thank God for Willie Nelson. Right. He um, <laughs> right. No shit. That's Mr. Funny. Unity himself. You Mr. Know. <laughs> the, the braids that brought it all together. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure Willie Nelson, if he brought his guitar, you know, he could, he could, um, you know, solve the Israel Palestine problem, <laughs> you know, just, just with, with a joint in his guitar. You know? <laughs> I, dude, that's a great image. Uh, first of all, that's funny. Um, you worked with Willie, didn't you? Did I read that? Um, I did. you worked um, with Willie? I did. I got to play on, um, uh, a few songs and on his record on, a guy's record and his record and another thing. And I got to open up for him a whole bunch. And wow. I met Lucas and Micah when they were kids. And, um, you know, it's not like we're buddies and hang out or anything, but you know, I was honored to get to work with him and it's amazing. He's super, he's super funny. That's what people really. Um, yeah. Willie knows more jokes than anybody. <laughs> really because, that's oh funny my god he's like a walking like you know i mean like old school jokes yeah like, okay you know? yeah 
um, but really funny stuff, you know. And I oh, remember that's awesome. I recorded, I recorded my first record at uh, his studio, and um, and I had just got this gig playing guitar with Waylon for this record that Waylon was doing in the nineties, and Ooh. I was I was a kid, you know. And oh my I went God. back to get a couple of amplifiers, and Willie and Pootie, his road manager, were sitting in the studio, and they go, "Hey, man, where are you going?" I said. Oh man, I just I got this gig. I'm gonna play guitar on Waylon's new record. And Willie goes, Waylon who? <laughs> <laughs> and for a minute, I was like, and then I realized, you know. You were like, wait, does he really yeah? Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That's his trick, though, right? That's his yeah, that's funny. Yeah, wow, dude. Ready. And Waylon Jennings. Jesus, dude. Oh my, oh wow. Then I read well, you work with Johnny Cash too. Like these are legends. Well, now, that was the first one was the Whalen um, gig. And um, we were on this record label. And the record label wanted to do uh, this producer from the label wanted to make a record on him. And and so it was a, it's crazy how it all happened, man. So I'm playing the Continental Club in Austin. Yeah, Imagine beautiful clubs, place. beautiful club. Yeah. And uh, this woman comes in, um, Evelyn, God, I can't remember her last name, but um, she was a big deal, big music business executive in Nashville, Evelyn Shriver. And she walks in, she goes, look, I'll never get you on the radio because you just, your sound is just so different, but I can get you on TV and you should come up to Nashville and be on this TV show. So I, I drive my truck, total cliche, you know, like walking cliche, man. <laughs> Guy from Beaumont drives his truck to Nashville. Beat up, beat up old truck, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. Totally, yeah. totally beat up, you know. Yeah. Um, I stay in the bricks because I can't afford to stay by Music Row. Um, <laughs> and I get on this uh, show called Crook and Chase. Very nice people, but very kind of square and not my thing bubble that I'm living in in Austin. Right. You know what sure. I mean? Totally. I like, I like I straight up thought this has got to be like a Christian. Podcast <laughs> thing. You know what I mean? Totally. Well, you're from Texas, right? You know, you know, yeah. this like yeah. Southern, Southern Texas. Baptist, like I get it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. All that stuff. So, um, so I go there and, um, and I'm getting my makeup done by with Ralph Emery, who's the, the legend, and 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 he's a, like you know the big DJ from Nashville, and 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 I go out and I do my set. Oh, and I'm getting my makeup done, and Evelyn comes by and goes, "Hey, I just want to tell you that um, Chris Christopherson's going to be on the show tonight, <laughs> and I want you to meet him." So Chris comes into the thing. Wow. And and we talked for about 15 minutes. He's like, yeah, I'm from Brownsville, Texas. <laughs> He's just totally badass like you would think. Totally. He would, you know, oh, just women yeah. just melting around every woman. <laughs> within, you know, every woman within a 30-mile radius is melting. Uh, uh, seriously, dude. I mean, you know, I mean. I'm, wow. I'm not, in, I'm not a dude, dude kind of guy, but sure. this guy was – handsome beyond all you repression. you you respected it right i mean you respect uh, yeah, it yeah i couldn't yeah. believe it you know yeah. i was like wow and um <laughs> even you were melting a little right even even I you, was, yeah I yeah was <laughs> i was definitely melting um in and, <laughs> and uh so anyway we i go out and i do my song you know and it's kind of this kind of whatever version of it because i didn't have my band so it's all these guys with you know pastel colors on their shirts backing me up you know they all look like the garth brooks thing and all that <laughs> and then afterwards chris christopherson says hey do you want to go to the gibson guitar factory with me oh, i'm looking at my watch it's like nine o'clock at night i'm like aren't they closed he goes oh they'll be they'll be open for us so we get back in this this is a crazy story we get in the back of this town car uh, with Evelyn Shriver, and I, I guess I—I I don't know how much of a family show this is, but I guess I can tell you this. Uh, oh, we go—we talk about everything. We say everything. Chris Burn Burn one 
on the oh, way. Fuck yeah. To the, to, to, on the way to the thing. And we talk about all these writers like Bukowski and the Beats and wow. Kerouac and all this stuff. And we really hit it off. And, and then um, we go to the Gibson Guitar Factory. And then that night he leaves and I drive my truck out back out to the bricks to this crappy Motel 8 where I'm staying. I'm thinking, well, I'm just going to go home in the morning. At least I got to hang out with Chris Christopherson. And burn one. And burn one. And And nobody, you know, I mean, yeah. So the next morning I get this phone call and, uh, the, the guy on the other end goes, Hey Hoss, I saw you on TV last night with Chris. And I called down to see where you were staying. And, uh, would you come over and play guitar for me at Woodland Studios? And it was Waylon Jennings. Oh my God. And so I went, I couldn't believe it. At first, I was like, is this really Waylon Jennings? Yeah. Like, <laughs> goes, All day long. <laughs> That's what he said. That's what he said. All, All day, day long. long. <laughs> Just cooler than hell, man. Perfect and answer, like, right? Yeah. yeah. So I jump in my truck. <laughs> it's like, it's like 1030 in the morning. Shit. And, uh, I jump in my truck and I drive over to this Woodland Studios and I knock on the door and Johnny Cash opens the door and I, and I'm, my mouth hits the ground and he goes, <laughs> are you just going to stand there with your mouth open or are you going to come in and play that thing? And, uh, and, uh, and so a lot of this footage from that first day is actually on YouTube. Uh, if you Google my name, Johnny Cash, Waylon Jennings. I see him. You'll see, yeah, you can Google it right now and it'll all come up. You'll see it on YouTube. And there was a film crew that very first day that I met them and they followed us around for like six hours. Comes up right away. In fact, it suggests it. Yeah, absolutely. And, there it and, is. Um, so anyway, that's wow. how it all started. And I kept my mouth shut and I played old school, you know, simple guitar shit that they liked and and um and what was going they, through your head i mean like don't fuck just, up is that all you were yeah, thinking yeah, just be just be easy and don't try to you know insert Overdo myself yeah yeah everything and you yeah. know what i mean yeah yeah totally rookie. so wow um, but it was cool and then they, they became really good friends and then at the end of the day he told me, Hey, I'm going to make a record in a few weeks. I'm going to fly you back out here and it's going to be you and Mark Knopfler and Pete Anderson from Dwight Yoakam's uh, band on guitars. And then I fly back out. And then he says that those guys aren't going to do it and that I'm going to play the stuff. And so, <laughs> oh man, uh, and, that, and that was the beginning. And then I got, you know, gigs with all the old guys, you know, who that was all I listened to. I mean, I yeah. wasn't listening to the Nashville radio. You know what I mean? I could sure. really care less. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, am- I mean, uh, that's, that's crazy. That's, um, do you, is it, you think it's like sort of like you make it in good with one of them? They sort of spread the word. Yeah. This kid's good. You know, is it that sort of deal? I mean, it sounds yeah. very country, right? Very. Yeah. No, no, it totally is. And, and I think that's what happened because next, my next gig was with Ray Price. And then the next one was, I did some stuff with Johnny Bush and Willie Nelson and then Glenn Campbell and, you know, and all that wow. stuff happened. And wow. in that day with Johnny, we did, we did some stuff and, um, you know, it, it, it was great. And it was, uh, you know, I was just trying to be nice. And, yeah. You know <laughs> totally. what I mean? And, totally. How have they influenced uh, what you've done since then? Like, uh, did they, did they really influence your songwriting <laughs> and, and everything? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, they influenced me before I met them. Because, sure. Um, of course. Was, we had this bubble in Austin that was really weird. You know, we had this, we had this incredible, um, you know, kind of old school country scene in Austin that they didn't have in LA, Nashville, London, New York, you know, Chicago, Seattle, any of those great music towns. 
And so we lived in this little insulated bubble where, you know, everyone was like rocking pompadours and tattoos and pointed toe cowboy boots. There'd be 600 of us on a Monday night, you know, in a, wow. in a small bar. Oh, yeah. I mean, in a small <laughs> club, you know. It'd yeah. Be, I mean, what years are these? Them. What years are these? It in was Austin? in the 90s. This was 90s. in the 90s. And I was young. And, and um, you know, Kelly Willis was there. And all these people were there playing. And, and, um, and it was very, it was awesome because it influenced so many musicians out of that scene and came out of that scene. Sure. And, um, yeah. You know. Was that like Bob Schneider time when he was sort of yes, taken off? Absolutely. Yeah. But, I mean, he, yeah, he was in a different scene than us because he was doing more like pop and rock and stuff like that. But Bob was killing it. And I love Bob. He's a sweetheart. He's a great guy. Yeah, um, he is. We've had him on the podcast. Bob so. had a, yeah, we had, he had a weekly gig at the Saxon pub. Yeah. And still, then I, still did up weekly, until recently. Yeah, and I had a weekly gig down the street at the Broken Spoke. Oh yeah! And one nice. time I saw one time I saw Bob at a Starbucks, and he came up to me and he goes, "You know, you can hold a lot more people in that Broken Spoke place than you can at the Saxon Pub." <laughs> and I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> I was that, like, "He's that checking like out Bob. the parking lot, you know." Yeah, like, do, that sounds doing like doing the Bob. math. You know yeah, I mean? <laughs> he's doing the math. Yeah. He had a beautiful Bob's mind a great moment. Business guy. For sure. Well, he does yeah, his own stuff. I, re I respect Bob a lot. Uh, he does yeah, his own stuff. Um, I do too. He was, yeah. he was doing it all on his own before a lot of people were, you know? Yeah, absolutely. No, for sure. Um, yeah, he's and he's still very well, you know, loved in, 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 in Austin yeah, and uh, in Texas. Yeah. Thing, and, uh, oh, for sure. You know, he tours all over, you know? Yeah, he's awesome. No, for sure. Much love. Uh, shout out to Bob. Uh, we actually, I hope to get him on uh, here again soon. He had a new album just come out, so hopefully we'll we'll get him on for that. But anyway, um, look, I also read this. Uh, you know, we're gonna. It's a podcast, man. So we're just gonna take a quick left turn. That's what happens. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I also read that. Um, I thought this was really cool. One, you directed your own horror film, which I love. I think that's yeah. awesome and you also but, but i and i feel like maybe is this why you got into it is because you had worked with rob zombie on the devil's rejects like making an album right is that yeah. sort of yeah. how that well, all connected I, or yeah i mean um i was a film nerd before i met rob but a, fr a really good friend of mine who was from the houston theater scene uh, named Lou Temple. He actually became a, a, a really, Lou is, uh, for years, Lou was in the top 3% working actors of SAG. Oh, wow. So he was one of those guys as a character actor where you would go, no, I've never heard of Lou Temple. And then you show him a picture and you're like, oh yeah, I've definitely seen that guy. Before. Yeah, I know exactly he just what you mean. Work all the time, you know, film, TV, constantly. Um, and uh, we were, you know, we still are to this day. We're best friends. And he called me and he said, hey, I'm doing this movie called The Devil's Rejects with Rob Zombie. And I told him about you. Um, oh, wow. I think he's going to call you. And I was like, cool. So Rob calls me and he's like, hey, we're making the ultimate white trash horror movie. And we think your music would be perfect, <laughs> which is kind of like a left-hand compliment. What? You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you're it's like, like, uh, like it's like somebody it's like yeah. somebody peeing on your leg and shaking your hand at the same time you know um and uh i love that so funny by the way i just looked up a picture and, of lou uh, temple uh yeah i know exactly who you're talking about like i, I i've seen this guy a million times uh, and stuff yeah i know yeah, who you mean yeah. he's been a ton of stuff yeah you know? yeah um that's funny and, though uh, anyway that they, so i end up doing <laughs> Yeah, I end up doing this fake record. Like it was like, you know how they do found footage in horror movies. Yeah, well, this was found demos that they had found in the movie. That's awesome. And yeah, crazy. Yeah, it's really smart. It's like Rob's that is really smart. Yeah, I mean it's a backstory that's really heavy and and so I actually did an interview with David Fricky from Rolling Stone where I didn't tell him I was Jesse Dayton. 
Wow. It was crazy. Yes. It was that's crazy. a character, right? That's like, that's going yes. deep. That's going yes. deep. And then, yeah. And so we sold that record to all of Rob's fans. And Martin Scorsese might be, you know, the greatest or tour director in the world, but Rob Zombie has sold more records than, than Martin Scorsese has. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, so I was, you know, thinking, wow, if we just sell a percentage of Rob's, you know, millions of fans, we'll do great. And I made the record in my buddy's living room for nothing. Wow. And, uh, and we did really well on it. So we went back and did another, we did Halloween. That movie, you know, he got yeah, he got to direct, he got to direct and uh, do a Halloween movie with you know Michael Myers and the whole thing, and he put me in that. Oh, really? Oh, fuck. yes, yes. And I ended up doing another whole completely different um, soundtrack, and we did videos for it. What? And we were this band. Yes, we were this band in the movie. It was a blast, man. It was so much fun. And, uh, you know, it was a big studio budget. So the, oh, yeah. You know, the money was great because, <clears throat> um, and, and so, and That's it's awesome. the gift that keeps on giving, you know, sure. Because it, that, movie, <laughs> that movie plays every year around the world. And, um, yeah, Rob gave point. me all the publishing. Oh, wow. That's cool. That's real yeah. cool. He's a great, he's a great guy and he's super smart. And I learned a lot of stuff from that guy. No, that's awesome. When you're writing the music for the, like, the, let's say the first one, let's go back to that album for the Devil's Reject. Had yeah. you seen footage from the movie or anything? What did you, what were you going no, off no. of? He, he called me up and he told me all these ideas in these situations. And I just sat there and took notes. Okay. Interesting. And then, and then I wrote all this stuff and then I went over to his, he was at he was on the lot like i don't know Lionsgate or paramount or wherever like what were these ideas like what was he saying like what i'm trying to picture him on the phone to you and you taking notes like what is he well, saying he, like you know, think this or... stuff. Well, on the second one it was more defined the halloween stuff was more defined but he wanted some really funny like old school country stuff okay um but he also wanted it to be with this kind of really edgy horror bent to it. So I wrote this one song called I'm at home getting hammered while she's out getting nailed. <laughs> and, and uh, yes. And that song is just, an, it's an underground hit, man. They play it every day on XM satellite radio. Um, wow. They used to, when it came out, they played it on multiple shows every day. And, um, but you know, now <clears throat> it's like so weird out there. Like, you know, you have to be like, I don't know, more careful 14, about things. 14 year old. No, you don't have to be careful, but like now it's like, like the uh, idea of a hit song is so weird now. Okay. That it's awesome because it, for guys like me, it's opened up like where we're just like, ah, we don't care anymore. We're just going to do whatever we want. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. That's, that's kind of cool though, in a way, right? As a fan, I mean, you're going to get not, the best from you. Not that you couldn't do whatever you want anyway. Sure. But you know, people that don't, yeah. People that, that think that, you know, I don't know. I mean, even the sex pistols wanted to, get on the radio you sure. know the, the ramones wanted to get on the, the most punk rock outside alternative stuff they still wanted to get on the radio it's not like you know but now it's just the formats are so bizarre like you have to be like a 14 year old urban youth artist <laughs> to, you know what i mean like Nobody wants to listen to an old dude like me from Beaumont. You know what I mean? Like, so it, it really worked great for me because it's made my cult following bigger and bigger and bigger. You know? Well, that's awesome. Well, the also the idea of like getting on the radio is like it's different now, right? I mean, what does that even mean? I don't even listen to the mean. radio. 
I, so I don't even know who's actually still <sighs> listening to the radio. I'm curious well, who's out there listening to the radio. I don't know. Well, so what I mean, I've obviously been doing, people do. I mean, yeah, what I've been doing since the proverbial rug got pulled out from under the entire world <laughs> yeah. um, um, is I've been I've been doing my own uh, show, my own DJ show on this on this uh, thing called give me country they have a show called give me metal too okay. and it's a radio format so people are really opening up to radio format sure that they never have before and it's kind of exciting you know um but yeah every week on wednesday <clears throat> i'll have a new guest it's every you just go wherever you get your podcast you put in g-i-m-m-e country and it's Jesse Dayton, Wednesdays, 4 p.m. Central Time, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern, 10 p.m. UK. And, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, it's it's people all over. And sure. uh, and I have, you know, I do what you're doing right now. I just, but, I, but the only difference is, is I can play any music I want. That's awesome. That's so, old school, right? That's old school radio. That really is what radio, you know, used to be, what people wanted to be. To be. Yeah, what it used to be uh, when I yeah. when I first, uh, you know, graduated high school, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to get into radio. I wanted to be a radio DJ. I wanted to play songs. Yeah. I wanted to procure lists yeah. and write and and do that. And and that just when, once I got into I realized this was 1998, 99. That's not the same. Like it's all yeah. computer. Computers were taking it over then. I thought, oh, I'm out of this. I mean, I never went back to it. You know, yeah. I, I I dropped out yeah, of it. DJs and, were going out. Everything was automated. Yeah, you weren't uh, actually picking you know, any songs. You know. Yeah, and the and the record labels controlled uh, what was being played. Yeah. Um, you know, because of you know the money they were spending and the advertising dollars. Yeah. Yeah. And that kind of thing. Um, yeah. But, you know, there's always been kind of left of the dial stuff. Sure. Where guys like me could really. Under 92. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, Americana. Yeah. Americana, man. When I first, my first record came out, it was number one on the Americana charts. And the Americana charts were like the ghetto that everybody wanted to get out of. Because, <laughs> it, you know what I mean? It was. And now it's you. It's massive, now, absolutely. Now it's like Jason Isabel, yeah, and, and selling as many records as any of the mainstream guys in, you know, uh, Nashville that have you know highlights in their hair and they're using, you know, drum loops or whatever. I don't. Know. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's funny. Uh, let's talk a little bit about this movie you directed. That's such a different thing. So oh, yeah. you well, were inspired by doing the music like for the horror or yeah, I mean, so, you said so, you were always so, a film buff. I was, and I still am. I'm a film nerd and I watch a lot of movies. Me too, man. Me uh, too. I do. And, and, um, but, uh, after, so when we did that Halloween, um, movie, and by the way, I didn't realize that Halloween is was at that time the biggest uh horror franchise you know of all time i still got little kids that come up to me you wow. know when i'm you know at walgreens or whatever and go hey are you captain clegg or you know <laughs> some goth chick or whatever some grandma that's into horror or whatever that's awesome um, well horror is a whole you know no, culture right yeah for sure yeah it is it really is and so anyway rob took us on tour um as the band from the movie and all of his crowd and pe for people like rob zombie he was big back in the 90s let me just let you in a little secret he's bigger now than he's ever been he's right under ozzy osbourne probably the same he's doing wow. huge shows He's ginormous because of his movies made him even bigger. Sure. Um, so he's not just human than human, you know what I mean? He's not just yeah. going out there and playing some hit from the 90s. So he, you know, we killed it. And so while I was on tour, I wrote a horror movie. Wow. And I wrote this whole kind of conspiracy theory thing about zombies and pharmaceuticals. It's actually what's happening right now. 
Um, but, um, and it was all set in new Orleans and, um, I had been in Rob's movie with Malcolm McDowell, who was in Clockwork Orange. Oh was, yeah, you amazing, know, amazing. For the youngsters, he was in um, Entourage movie. You know, what I mean, he's yeah, been in, he's he always works. You I'll know? always know him from a Clockwork Orange. That's yeah, how yeah. I. To me, that's it. that's it. Yeah, yeah. So once I got Malcolm, um, then I got the money. Wow, that's so literally, literally, I got Malcolm in within two or three days we had all the money <laughs> and then and then we got we built all these strange um people around him like we brought in Sid Haig um we brought in Corey Feldman I had to fight to get Corey Feldman with the producers because they're like nobody cares about Corey Feldman I'm like I care about him I like <laughs> off boys I like stand by me. Are you like kidding said, me? Hell yeah. I was like, there's a lot of guys like me who are going to go, wow, that's cool. He put a, he did yep. a, a, you know, a walk on scene with, you know, yeah. with Corey Feldman. Yeah. And sure enough, it worked. And anyway, I, I didn't, you know, we made this little movie and, and we took it to Cannes and we sold it at the horror uh, after hours thing. And, we did great. I mean, it was like, that's awesome. You know, it was, it was a really, it was not that much fun to do though. Let me just tell you. <laughs> like the it actual not, process was, of making it, you, yes, you did not yeah, enjoy. Yeah. It. Yeah. Let me just go on. <laughs> let me just go on the record and tell you this. When people go, musicians always want to be actors and actors always want to be musicians. Let me let you in on a little secret. Actors want to be musicians a fuck ton harder than musicians want to be actors. <laughs> because even if you're Robert De Niro or Alec Baldwin or Brad Pitt or whoever, you're sitting around in a trailer on set all day long. Damn. And then you do work and then they chop it up and they turn it into what you have no control. Yeah. Yeah. They turn. I mean, so you get some when you become a huge star, but sure. ultimately, whatever you do is there to serve the story. Yeah. Now, let me tell you, that is lame compared to walking on stage to five thousand <laughs> people and having them freak out immediately when you walk out there. Totally. I mean, the, the one, the no one, uh, the one lighting guy or grip guy claps for you when you come out to the to the state, right? Like, yes, yeah, yeah. But, but, oh. They're like, uh, Brad, thanks so much for everything that 12 people, you know. Thanks so much, Brad. You know what I mean? Totally. And then, and then, and then you get home and there's like paparazzi in your trees in your backyard. And that's got to be weird. Oh, I couldn't. I don't, I would be arrested for assault. I, every time I see a celebrity yeah. that like hits them with the car or punches them, I get it. I totally I get it. That would be me. That's so fr such yeah. an invasion of privacy. Like, absolutely, I, I, yeah, that's insane. Well, wow, that's amazing. Do you have any any uh, plans to maybe do another film? Well, I mean, I've done acting in films yeah. since then, and um, I like it a whole lot, lot better. Book, and you don't have to like herd squirrels all day. <laughs> Like, so this is the, this is the day of a director. Um, you show up at 6 a.m. Then your crew shows up at 7 a.m. Then the talent shows up at 8 a.m. Then the talent leaves at whatever, 10 that night. And the crew leaves, then you're the last one to leave. So it's like sleep deprivation and problem solving and managing and therapist. I mean, to be a director is just insane. And uh, I have all the respect for people, but I would much rather, you know, play the white trash guy in the film and show up and get my ass kissed and get my paycheck and go home and not have to worry about. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I get it. I get it. Of course. Uh, absolutely. Maybe. What, what's like a favorite thing you've done recently? Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you that. Check this out. This is crazy. This is a, we, I haven't even told anyone this. Um, 
Beautiful. So I've been home. I'm writing this book for Hachette Book Group, right? Okay. And 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 I was writing these rants online, and a friend of mine who's a literary agent um turned a friend of ours who's a big book editor at Hachette Books on and he said hey tell jesse dayton to give me three chapters anybody of anything he wants to write about and i'll i'll bring it up in the meeting we did and so i got a book deal out of it and so i just finished writing it seventy five thousand wow. word book um i'm wow. doing the revisions on it right now but it's basically done so <clears throat> you know a lot of my friends were doing these live streams yeah you know and yeah. Because, you know, we're all musicians and we got to figure out how to, you know, it's not just about making money. It's not just about staying relevant. It's about feeding your soul. You know, you want to do what you love to do, play music. So I was like, okay, I'm going to, could I, and I did a few of those and they were great. They were successful. But I was, when I got done with the book, I was like, okay, let's do something. So I was like, let's put together a little like show like a little let's i'll direct it we'll put together a little uh series type pilot um of stuff that i do in my life so um i i filmed me and my wife emily um we were riding vintage motorcycles around austin and then and then we went to the studio and I did this song for this Joe Strummer birthday thing for the clash. Wow. And it, it had, you know, Lucinda Williams and Bruce Springsteen, all these people who are much, much bigger than I am. But Joe's wife had me on and I met her in London. And it was, so I filmed that. Wow. And then I filmed me and a friend of mine who's a chef. And we, we made Asian Cajun redfish with the head on. Um, and wow. then I put it in this, so I put it all together and I was going to release it to my fan base is like, Hey, this is something different for them to watch while we're all quarantined and, and hopefully they'll dig it. You know, it was like a little lifestyle, you know, thing. Yeah. And, uh, so we put the, uh, we put the, um, trailer out and I'll send you the trailer after we get offline so you can check it out. So we put the trailer out on my websites and we got a development deal through a production company. So I'm fixing Fuck. to start shooting my own uh, reality show with me and my wife in it about, you know. What you do. What I do yeah. and all these friends of mine. And, yeah, and, that's and, awesome. And, Wow. Yeah. So that's kind of the next thing we're going to do. And we, we actually just, um, you know, locked it down like Monday. That's that's awesome. Um, you know who I I had on, uh, did you ever see the show on HBO max house of ho? Did you watch that show? I had, I had them on, uh, recently that they, the way they got their development deal for that show is really interesting too. It's a, it's always interesting how those, how it works out i don't know i'm not saying your show is like that obviously it's not no but whatever but, yeah 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 mm-hmm. uh no that's cool um so you live in austin do you live in austin I live in austin i bought a house here um i married a nice jewish girl from los angeles who couldn't be from a more different place <laughs> than i'm from totally. i mean the poor the poor girl ended up <laughs> just knuckle dragon heathen redneck from beaumont texas you know and I, i'm actually not you know um but <laughs> but you know what i'm saying sure um, of course no i get but, it but but uh my wife's from spain we're different you know different as well yeah yeah I and it. it just works and we've yeah. been together a long time you know through the good and the bad and so we ended up buying a house and south austin 20 almost 20 years ago so oh nice i just moved from austin i was there i like two weeks ago literally a few just two weeks ago yeah to dallas uh moved back to dallas here uh but i was in austin for almost a decade 
Um, I'm gonna miss it. I'm not gonna lie. I gotta miss yeah. what I miss. What I what sucks is this. Is what I tell people. I had to spend the last year of being in Austin, like locked down, and then the pandemic. Right, like I didn't really get to enjoy the city the way I would have loved the last year. Yeah. Right, you know what I mean. That kind yep, of sucks. Yep. No, I got you. Um, why did you move to Dallas? My fa- like my family's oh, here, like my you. nephews, my br- sure, my brother, sure, sure. my mother. People are there, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I work from home, so yeah. it's not, you know, it hey, just dude, makes I sense. Totally get it. Yeah, you get I it, totally man. Get it. That's, totally. You know, I'm very, you know, I tour the state long enough to know that when you live somewhere and people say I live in Houston or I live in Dallas, it's not your job as an Austin person to go, Oh, well, sorry, bro. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. had to leave the coolest, you know, those people. <laughs> Dude. Uh, absolutely. It's, like, yeah. it's just such a lame thing to tell people. It's like sure. Dallas might be the greatest thing that ever happened to you. T- totally you know what it's, i'm saying yeah absolutely uh like, i'm all about food so i defend cities by food yeah does that why, make, does why, that make sense I, yeah how is it. you living in dallas going to affect my happiness in austin? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if anything people in austin should be happy people are leaving right that because that's what you yes, hear in yes, austin yes. constantly yeah, yeah oh it's, it's not like it used to be that's what everyone um, says right but then um, it, you go back to that person you know 20 years ago and they go it's not like it used to be everyone says it until the day austin yeah. was was founded as a city they'll be saying it right like it's never what it used to be uh i mean that's just how it goes right it's yeah but anyway yeah, yeah how many old hippies in austin do, how many old hippies in all in south austin does it take to um unplug a light bulb um apparently all of them they just sit around and talk about how cool the old light bulb is. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Oh shit! I'm stealing that. That's hilarious. Yeah. That's but you know, <laughs> my my parents, my mom went to college here, and and so I've been here. I've been coming here. You know, I remember the hippie chicks in the '70s walking up and down when I was a little kid. You know, yeah, like looking at girls, you know, with hip huggers and halter tops on, and you yeah. know, the heyday. And you know, man, I mean. Things change. I mean, what are you going to do? Are you going to sit around and like totally kvetch about it the whole time? You know what I mean? That's me, man. I, you know, to me, your world is your friends, your family, right? Like that's really your right. world. You know what I mean? So the, the rest is sort of noise and I'll make the best of it. I mean, look, I've lived and traveled in a lot of places, so maybe that's sort of my mentality. I don't really care where I'm at. I like I'm gonna make the best, you know what I mean? Like I'm gonna make the best of it no matter what and appreciate it for what it is. Yeah, my family's a, a very old Texas family. And when I was younger, I see when I was younger that, you know, sometimes I would, you know, talk about that as if I had something to do with it. As if, as if, <laughs> you know, as if I like on the operating table before I was born, I poked my head out and said, Hey, can you guys make sure that I was, I'm born in Texas and that my name's <laughs> Jesse Dayton and that, you know, like, like, you know, like I didn't have anything to do with it. I'm proud of it, but yeah. I don't talk about it. Um, like I used to now I'm like, because you know, I'm a, I, I'm I'm a global citizen first. I'm an American second, and I'm a Texan third. There you um, go. Because, I always say I'm a Texan before an American, though. I don't know why. I just yeah, that's fine. That's it. fine. I just don't want to secede. I no, just, no, I think no. We just found out that that didn't work too well. No, no. Okay? But yeah, our energy energy grid. Hello, people. without going into yeah. that too deeply, <laughs> but you're yeah. right. I'm with you there. No, I don't want to secede. Oh, yeah. what, 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 can you imagine Texas on its own? It would not be where I would want to live. I'm going to be real honest. I know uh, Texans, so that's not where I want to be if they get alone. Um, oh, right. Dude. Yeah. Hey, we <laughs> you're nothing without other people. You need other people. Yes. And, you know, yes. I, I play, I don't know, 200, 250 shows a year all over the world forever and ever just taunting us. And after a while you become, you're like, 
you're like, oh yeah, we're in Paris tonight. Well, I'm going to go, you know, you just, it, it, it doesn't, you start seeing that like everybody in every town in every country in the world is exactly the same. Totally. Exactly. That's exactly right. You know, they might not have my heritage. Sure. You know, they might not have relatives that fought in the San Just Battle of San Jacinto or whatever kind of stuff, but they had relatives that, you know, fought and whatever. You know what I mean? Like it's just it's just, and, and and I'm not um, you know, I'm sure people are gonna hear this and go, well, he sure isn't proud of where he's from. It's like, dude. <laughs> I'm, I know Please. more about the history. I'm a freak show history guy, right? Yeah, like, yeah. I, I mean, I know, you know, and not to mention, I'm just obsessed with Texas culture. I mean, Me too. I'm, like the, I'm like the Imelda Marcus of cowboy boot owners, man. <laughs> You know what I need help with? You could probably give me some advice on this. Where should I, where's the best place for me to get a hat? Is it Gorin? Well, I mean, I, if I was you, I would go to a place called Texas Hatters. Okay. And it's out, it's in Lockhart outside of Austin. And they, they, so check this out Four generations. They did all of John Wayne's hats. Oh, they shit. still do all, they still do all of Dwight Yoakam's hats. Oh, wow. Uh, they do. They did all of the hats that are in Lonesome Dove, which is the finest uh, Lonesome story, Dove, yeah, finest story ever written about Texas ever. You know, it's like it's a close second to the Bible. Lonesome Dove, you know <laughs> in this state, in this state, you're yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And, Texas Hatters, uh, okay. Texas Hatters, and ask for Joel J O E L, and say Jesse Dayton sent you. And uh, just next time you're down in Austin, or you can look online, you know. But it, but it. For me, it's really nice, you know, if you get somebody to, you know, actually measure your head. Yeah, that's there. what I want. I want the right. Yeah. I want to do it right. I mean, this is I want something, you know, I want to do it the right way uh, for sure. Yeah. You know, it's it's and something so you need, respect in this state. Right. You get the right hat. Like, yeah, I want to do it the right way for sure. And if you're in Texas, you want to wear your felt hat in the winter and your straw hat in the summer, because if you don't. Every guy that thinks he's a rodeo star, but is actually not, <laughs> will call you out. <laughs> okay. That's how I start out my book. Like I talk about like, like Texas is like, like I've, all, I've got a small handful of friends who are actually like cowboys. And then wow. every, you know, me included, every one of us that has a cowboy hat, you know, I don't own a horse. You yeah, know what, so, what? You don't own a horse? You're Texan. You don't own a horse or six yeah. shooters? What? Remember, next time you go to, you know, a big country music concert, just look around and just just know in your heart that like 80% of the people there have never even been on a horse. 100%. Yet they're completely decked out in boots, in hats, in buckles, in the whole gear. Absolutely. You know, we had a we had a name. Uh, I can't say the name anymore. But when I was in high school, I went to high school, in Texas. I went to school here, in Texas. Yeah, you know, we had a name for people that dressed up like that. Uh, but I can't say it. So anyway, yeah, I'm not allowed to say that name, but uh, maybe maybe, you know it. I well, don't know. I think, no, I think. That, yeah, I think I think I know it. But uh, my grandfather said all cat, all hat, no cattle. <laughs> that's funny all yeah. hat no cattle i'm stealing yeah. that too that's a yeah that is funny but, but like my buddy ryan bingham you know now he's a real legit like got his rodeo card and grew up on a ranch and he's a badass right like he's, he's a real you can tell by the hands badass. right yeah. let's be real you can tell by the hands yes yes and uh I don't know, I, but I still love the whole culture, and I still Me wear too. cowboy boots, and I love. Sure. It. Yeah, no, us too, man. I mean, look, we're sponsored by Texas Real Food. Uh, we support the Texas farmers and ranchers of the state. Right. You know, so that's a big part of uh, what we do here. Um, and I love that you brought up the food thing um, as well. Yeah. I didn't know you cooked. I do cook, well. man. All the men in my family cook. 
Uh, my my father cooked, my grandfather cooked, my brother, my uncles. Wow. You know, it's kind of a weird thing because we grew up on that Texas Louisiana border. Yeah. Where there was a lot of Cajuns. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And um, and so there was a level of, you know, it wasn't just throwing meat on the grill. It was like we knew how to make a roux and you know um, now we're talking. Hell yeah, yeah, that kind of stuff, you know, and um it, it's it's fascinating and and uh, I like that you support Texas ranches and farmers because I think that some of the first, you know, today's a weird this, you know, world's getting more and more, you know, the, the culture wars and you know, this binary thinking, you either have to be vegetarian or you have to be, you know, hunter or whatever, you know. Sure. Yeah, yeah. That you, that you can't do both, you know. Exactly. I mean? you can't, exactly. Like, you can't eat vegetarian on Tuesday nights because it's against your, like, you know what I mean? It's crazy. Sure. sure. And, and it, like, like none of us can walk and chew gum at the same time, you know. <laughs> um, but I think it's really interesting that the ranchers in Texas were some of the first real ecologists and some of the first real, like they knew how to take care of their animals and keep yeah, them healthy and make, absolutely. Sure, make sure that they, they weren't overpopulated or getting diseases or destroying crops or sure. stuff like that. So, they're, they're, you know, my, my grandparents never had organic food. Yeah. All, all, all of their stuff was organic. Because it was it was just food. It was yeah, and they didn't have all those chemicals. Yeah, and stuff, you know. And I'm I'm infinitely fascinated by that, and that that we've kind of created this problem for ourselves. It is a problem we created for ourselves. But I will I will give you a ray of hope here. Like it, 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 things are getting much better, and the and the communication. Honestly, the pandemic helped a lot of farmers and and ranches out because it allowed them to immediately start connecting with customers that they couldn't before because you know grocery stores were getting overloaded the the yeah, food lines yeah yeah exactly so they were going direct to customer and you you know I talked to farmers and ranchers they literally sales going up a thousand percent you know saving businesses uh, allowing them to start like again delivery so that's all it is for people it's just convenience right i mean you ask people why don't you eat why don't you buy from farms or why don't you well i don't know how i don't i don't have time to go to the farmers market i only have a 2 hour window to go to the farmers yeah. market on a saturday morning to get all my food you know i need to be able to just head down to the grocery store and get it and blah 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 and, so they're just finding ways to connect with them to make it more convenient and people will just inevitably buy and honestly they realize the prices aren't that bad either they're pretty close and Dude, when you start right much more, it's really it's not, not much more and it's money. healthier it's and it's way gonna healthier. save you for the money at the doctor exactly That's um because you're exactly. not getting all those steroids yeah you know and 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 uh i love this direct customer new thing that we're living in paradigm we're living in and you know um back in the day um you know so I haven't eaten factory meat in six years. Wow. That's incredible. I stopped, dude. And I just stopped and 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 neither has my wife. And um, but back in the day, what they would do is uh families would all go in on a really nice, you know, piece of on on you know on beef. Sure. They would all go in and they would butcher you know, the cow or they would butcher uh, a pig or whatever it was. And so they didn't have all those steroids. And I mean, now it's just, especially chickens, it's just, and I don't want to get, you know, I don't want to go down that thing because that's a whole other, For you sure. know, uh, just shit show. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole podcast episode. Trust me. We've yeah, done lots yeah, of it, them. <laughs> it is, but, but uh, you know, it's great now, man, because, I heard this great story uh, that in the nineties, there was all these uh, ranchers in the Davis mountains, which is outside of Marfa. It's beautiful out there. Beautiful. Right? Yeah. Beautiful. And, uh, and so I think it was UCLA or USC or one of them, they went to all these families and they said, Hey, listen, we'll pay for all of your um, cattle 
um, to be fed and medical bills and everything, if you'll let us replant this grass on your, um, and we want to do this over like five year period. And they were like, yeah, all these families have been there forever. And they're right. like, yeah, we'll do that. You know? <laughs> so anyway, this Davis beef became this organic, no steroid. Like it's like wasagi or whatever that uh, Japanese beef is. It's like become like a thing. Wagyu. 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 Yeah. Wagyu. Yeah. yeah. Wagyu. Um, and to me, that's fascinating. If you can take old ranch families from Texas that probably been there a hundred years and turn Abs- there, absolutely. anyone can do it. You know? Yes, yes, a hundred percent. Yeah, uh, well, we're, real quickly, I mean, just for people listening, Kobe is from, right, from Japan and Wagyu is our version of Kobe. So that's okay. what that that's all that means. And and Kobe is a place in Japan. So there's actually different versions of K- Kobe that they would call, right? So the, the cow might come from a particular other place, it, but it's still, it's still a Kobe style beef, but Kobe is the town that it comes from, but there's other ones. And anyway, not to get too technical. Interesting. On, no, on all that I didn't know that. I'm, you know, that that's my thing, man. I'm a, you know, I, I moved to the reason I moved to Austin is to open my food truck and I had a food truck in Austin for many years. I'm a chef. I mean, that's, that's what I do. Uh, Great, so. man. What kind uh, of stuff yeah. did you do? I serve uh, Spanish food. Boca, maybe you ate it, my stuff. Uh, it's called Boca. I had it in Austin for, oh, yeah. for five years. Before. Yeah, that was me, man. Yeah. That was Boca. That's, uh, that was me. That was me. Wow. That's great, man. Yeah. So yeah. You had a, Paella and all that, like you had all that stuff, right? We we did, man. We went through so much. Yes, I did everything uh, at some point, especially with catering. Uh, you start to really expand on your menus and what you're going to do. That that's where the most exciting. Like I I would um I would do the Grammy party for the Aca- recording academy there in Austin at the Gibson showroom every December. I would, yeah. you know, cater that whole party and I, I would get to do really exciting food for that. Or when I worked South by for like Showtime, Showtime would hire me every year and I would get to do exciting food based on sort of like what you did music for the movie. Well, I would do food yeah. for the show. Sure. Right. So like Shameless, I did, you know, uh, yeah, you catered food, it. yeah, I can't. So I did food for Shameless. I did food for Chi, you know, you, you know, show yeah, Chi. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was really cool. That was a so you got to expand on your food and sort of experiment and do uh, other things. And you your know, wife's so, yeah. from Spain. Yeah, I lived I lived in Spain for for a while, and I met Where? her there and uh, all over. Man, I I I lived all you know all over Granada, Galicia. So so, so just so you know, that's my biggest market outside of the United States. Really, it's Spain. It is. It is. Yeah, and we go a lot. And wow. And, um, you know, I've tried to figure out why I think maybe it's because, you know, maybe I got darker hair, darker features and I'm kind of, I, uh, you know, the Texas wide open music and that's big in Spain. That's why, you know, that, that stuff is huge in Spain, the Spanish, um, uh, influence, you know, because I always do a couple of songs that have that kind of, you know, San Antonio kind of, you know, Flaco Jimenez and and all that kind of stuff. Um, But um, man, I'll tell you, after this just incredible apocalypse that we've been through, (laughs) there, there, there's a part of me that wants to just take off to the beach in the North of Spain. Yeah, man. Just rent a house out there and just hold up there for a while. Like, oh my god i get out of this insanity because i mean the food yeah. is you know man you know more than than i do the food is yeah ridiculous i lived in galicia i worked in galicia too for quite a while um isn't it beautiful oh just the most gorgeous um you know it, i tell people all the people time are it was, i lived in a part that that's called um there's a little island called ogrove which is just off the coast there by uh, the most famous town is Vigo that p- p- people would know it was close to that. But, but that was actually where it was called Finisterra, which is what the end of the earth. So at th- this beach where I lived for many months, it was literally what was at one time considered the end of the earth. And, and just to be there and like experience that was 
something else. I, I got I got to say it was it was something else. Well, that whole region is just. I mean, I don't think people really. Um, you beyond know, beautiful, it's like it's beyond yeah. beautiful. In it's my unreal. hacky construction Tex-Mex Spanish, <laughs> that's just god awful, <laughs> right? Uh, and you know, and they all they all speak with that lisp thing. Yeah, you know, that, that Castellano. Lisp. That's all it is. Yeah. It's just a Castellano. Yeah, and uh, but it gets me through. Sure. You know what I mean, and yeah. and 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 they're they're more welcoming than the French are, and they're more welcoming than than the Brits are, and and um. Well, let's and drink. That's good because it's all about. Let's just sit down. Let's have a drink. Let's eat. Let's yeah, let's drink let's, wine. Yeah, let's, let's relax. Like the, it's yes. all about relaxing. I feel like in, what I learned in Spain is that everyone's always the the bit the best word that people love to use is tranquilo. Just relax. As they, people say all the time. And people said to me all the time because I was just very wound up. Yeah, wound up and antsy. Like, yeah, Amer exactly, <laughs> man. Ready to go. Everything ready to go, you know, all the time. Like, no breaks. Like, let's go. Every I'm used to things, op you know, I'm used to p places being open 24 hours a day, okay? Yeah. Th this th Spain does not work like that. You're going to go run an errand. You're going to go run one errand that day. Maybe. Because yeah. you stop for coffee 12 times, literally. And you're going to eat at 10 o'clock at night. Yeah, I actually still do that. So I, it's been 10 years, but I still we still maintain a Spanish um, your time structure. Your, uh, yeah, yeah. I eat, I eat breakfast at about you know, 10 or 11 a.m. I eat lunch yeah. about 3, and I eat yeah. dinner about 9 or 10 p.m. Correct. Yeah, all the and, time. And there's no, depending on what you eat, you don't like blow up. You don't become like you don't put on a ton of lbs because. Oh yeah, because lunch is lunch is your biggest meal in Spain. Yeah, and 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 um, one thing I learned, um, you know, I, like I, I, one of the last places I went to was Spain before this whole thing happened, and um, they were telling me that the bread in Spain and in France. Um, is doesn't ha we have this monster Monsanto wheat and it's this looks like it's like literally like a Frankenstein scary wheat <laughs> so the human body can't it's really big yeah you know because Americans you know like industrialized oh. corporatized and so so that that stuff doesn't break down in your body is yeah. easy yeah but the wheat over there it's the same wheat they've been growing for thousands of years. And uh, that's how they can eat all that bread. That's how the you know French can eat all that bread. And Yeah, that's and a good point. Uh, absolutely. That's a great point. Uh, bread is definitely a part of the diet there. I don't know anyone that's like, I don't eat bread. You don't hear anybody yeah. going, I'm gluten free over here. Yeah, that's not, I pasta. never. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah, exactly. And pasta too. Um, uh, to, to, but to, to be honest, in Spain, they don't eat is that much pasta i guess no, maybe maybe a, maybe a couple dishes here or there yeah. With, uh, but, like rice type dishes or definitely whatever. a lot of rice you know Sp spanish is all about quality ingredients simply put on a plate so it, it, they do eat a lot of tapas everywhere i mean that is the way to eat i mean it has its own word tapear i mean that's like you go out to tapear to eat and that's what it's about it's like literally no, no show. It's just we we cut some fresh whatever and put it on a plate and give it to you. That's Spanish food. That's that's so what it is. And it's great because you're like, there's no huffs or puff about. It, right. It's just they give me this amazing whatever it is, a slice of ham, a fresh cut tomato, some goat cheese uh, in Saladilla Rusa. I mean, I could go to town. Right. Just any little thing they're making. It's simple, yeah. but it's fresh and it's from that town. And it's delicious. You know, the wine you're drinking will be from that town. The beer you're drinking will be from that town. The food they just got from there, like every the the yeah. the jamon will be, you know, uh, dried in the mountains of that particular region, and blah blah yes. blah. And it's awesome. I mean, you just it's it's unbelievable. It's amazing. And and back to what I was saying earlier, when I said people are the same everywhere. There's a bunch of old cynical guys sitting around complaining about politics in Spain too. Yes. There's a bunch of old guys that are sitting around complaining about sports. 
Yeah. Because they're obsessed with, because, you know, soccer, they're yeah. what they call football. Yeah. Yeah. It's just as obsessive to them. Um, you know, there's all kinds of stuff. So people think, oh, I can escape all this. This is, you know, totally. It's like, it's, you won't it's, escape it's, it. You won't ever escape it. No. Um, it's there's all assholes about, everywhere. Yeah. And it's all about what kind of reality you build for yourself. You know, that's right. That's right, man. Uh, anyway, no, that's, that's exactly what, right. what a, what a pleasure hanging out with you. Dude, dude. This was awesome, man. I, I got to go, tell we gotta you, go have dinner one night and let's like, do it. Take me to, like, let's or, or we'll make dinner one night, you know, whatever you want, man. Look, I know a ton of people and I know tons of chefs in Austin, tons of, you know, my buddies have places and I mean, love to take you out to a, a place there or we can cook something too. I mean, I'm all about it, man. Uh, well, for when, sure. If we get, if we get past this next hurdle on the pilot uh, and then they, uh, because we're going to be doing different shows with different chefs, maybe we can have you on and we could have you and your wife on. And that'd be awesome. You know, and I could say, come a thought with, <laughs> with that, t with that crazy TH that just. Absolutely. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah your, no. man, your man meter goes off when the first time you hear that, you're like, I don't know, man. This guy looks pretty tough, you know. Like, I'm pretty sure this Spanish guy can take me, but he's saying TH on everything. <laughs> oh, shit. That's so funny, dude. Uh, you get it. You get it. I, I get love it, it, brother. That's funny. Yeah, man. This was awesome. Uh, absolutely. We'll definitely stay in contact. Uh, Jesse, I can't tell you how much fun this was, man. This is why I love this doing my job. You know, now, 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 I'm, a pod, now I'm a podcaster. I'm not a chef You're anymore. I'm a podcast. Wow, well, thank you, man. I appreciate it. I try. I care. You know what it is? I just I care. I love talking to people and I, I genuinely care. That's really yeah. what it is. Well, listen, Jesse, listen, my best to you and uh your wife. Yep. And uh y'all stay safe out there and we'll definitely stay in contact and uh wish you the best, man. Thank you so much. All right, brother. All right, boss. Be good, bud. Thank you. See you All right, bye bye. The Lone Star Play Podcast is produced by Texas Real Food. Go to texasrealfood.com and you can search your city for stores, butchers, restaurants, farmers markets, and more who are using fresh, artisanal, organic sources. It's a fun site that brings all natural options all together. I hope you enjoyed this episode. For more information, go to thelonestarplay.com. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Until next time. <laughs>